Hello, and welcome to my Rylum webinar presentation on the topic of cement additives and concrete admixtures, an industrial perspective. I'm Jeff Thomas. I'm a scientist with GCP, which is now a St. Gobain company. So let's get started with some definitions. Uh, cement additives are liquid mixtures of chemicals that are added during the clinker grinding process. And there's two broad categories. Uh, grinding aids are chemicals that actually improve the grinding process itself. So they make it more efficient, they increase the uh, throughput of the mill, and they can have some effect on the powder characteristics of the cement, such as flowability. However, when you use the cement to make concrete, they don't have much effect on, on the hydration process. The other category is quality improvers, and these do all of what the grinding aids do, but then also when you go to make the concrete, you get improved properties, which can be uh, particularly strength enhancement, but also things like set time adjustment if needed uh, and reduced water demand. The other broad category we'll talk about are concrete admixtures. These, again, are liquid mixtures of chemicals that are added now during the mixing of the concrete, so when the cement is used to, to make the concrete. Um, a, a really important objective here that we'll talk about a lot is the improvements in rheology and the reduced water demand that you can get with admixtures. Uh, but there's many other things, probably even more so than with cement additives, um, that can be done. Uh, you can also adjust the set time. Um, there's air entrainment, which helps improve against frost resistance, and I'll talk briefly about some of those. So we'll start by discussing uh, grinding aids, and I think it's useful to just uh, look at a cement plant where the cement is being made. So this is a, a large installation where, where you have a quarry and all the raw materials are being uh, taken out of the ground, proportioned um, so that you have the right uh, elemental composition, and then they go into a kiln where they're heated up to very high temperatures, uh, and this creates the clinker. Uh, so this is the all the cement minerals that are going to be hydrating, uh, but it's not a fine powder yet, so it's not quite done. So this clinker then uh, is cooled and taken over to a large mill where it's ground into a fine powder, and this is also when you add the gypsum, which is necessary to control the early hydration. And so just as the clinker is entering the mill, the liquid cement additives are added on top of it so that they can help the process as, it, as it's being ground. So this is a uh, typical mill, a ball mill that's used to grind the cement. This is the oldest uh, technology that's been around for over 100 years. Uh, so it simply rotates and these steel balls inside then smash into each other and then smash the clinker up between them, uh, creating a fine powder. Um, so uh, this is the uh, typical technology and you can see the, the, the scale of it. it's obviously very large as a person inside uh, inspecting it. Um, I think it's more useful to look at the entire grinding circuit. So this consists of the ball mill, which you can see at the center here. Um, here's the fresh feed, which is the clinker going in and the grinding chemical. Um, and then so the material that passes out of the ball mill is actually has a very wide range of particle sizes. So some, some, some of the particles are fine enough that they're ready to be taken away as cement and other ones are actually still too coarse. So what happens is it goes through another piece of equipment called a separator. Um, and the separator does exactly that. It takes away the fine particles and sends them out um, to the silo because they're done, but the heavier particles fall through the separator uh, and they're actually carried back around to the beginning, to the start of the ball mill. So uh, as the ball mill is running, what's going in is a combination of the fresh clinker and the returns that were too coarse to be ground the first time. And so what the grinding aid does is it makes the separator act more efficiently. So um, normally, if you don't have a grinding aid, particularly um, a lot of fine particles that should be taken away into the cement actually end up going through and getting ground again unnecessarily. So this could happen because they're agglomerated uh, into larger particles or uh, there may be stuck to a larger particle. So in any case, a lot of them get carried back. When you use a grinding aid, um, the separator works much better. And what happens uh, actually is the grinding aid acts as a dispersant. So it actually removes all these agglomerates, it breaks them up. And so the fine particles then are actually treated separately. They're actually carried in the air separately. And so the separator is able to take them out. So 
what are the mechanisms uh, that the grinding aids work? So it's pretty simple. Um, these, these grinding aid chemicals simply adsorb onto the surface of the particles. And so whereas when you break apart these particles, the surface forces want to bring them back together and have them agglomerate, the grinding aid chemical just adsorbs onto the surface and prevents that from happening. So there's some steric hindrance and it neutralizes the electrostatic forces and just basically acts as a dry dispersion. So we talked about how that reduces agglomeration, which, which improves the efficiency of the grinding process. Um, that, that agglomeration can actually happen right onto the grinding media as well. And so you can see that uh, you get a coating on them if you don't have a grinding aid, and that actually cushions the blow or makes it less efficient. So you get a more efficient energy transfer as well for breakage with the grinding aids. So this plot here uh, actually shows more quantitatively what happens with the efficiency of the grinding process. So uh, on the excess axis, we have grinding energy or in a ball mill, that's just grinding time, how long you're grinding for. And then on the y-axis, we have the specific surface area of the powder. So assuming that you're starting with something pretty coarse, uh, initially you have a linear response. So the, if you want to get a set increase in surface area, you just have to grind for a set amount of time and it just goes linearly. Uh, but inevitably, as the particles get finer, uh, you get less efficiency, which means you need to get uh, you need to grind for longer and longer to get the same increase in surface area. So the red dashed curve uh, indicates what happens without a grinding aid. You actually get less and less efficient, and you actually can reach a point where you, you stop increasing the surface area, right? You can't increase it forever. Uh, when you use a grinding aid, uh, because it improves that efficiency, um, you get uh, less deviation uh, from linearity. You can grind to a finer uh, maximum fineness, and if you have a set fineness out in this range here, then actually it takes you less time to get there, and that's a big advantage when you're talking about an industrial process. If you could do the same thing in less time, that's always better. So uh, it's good to then take a step back and remember why we're grinding the cement to a relatively high fineness. So uh, if you want to get good compressive strength development, particularly at early times, you do need to have a fine cement. So as this data shows here, this is some older data from 1951, but it's showing that um, at a relatively young age, now seven days is really not that, not that early, but it's the earliest time shown here. At early times, uh, when you have a low fineness, the compressive strength is much lower than it is when you have a higher fineness. Now it's showing at later times, it doesn't make as much difference. But of course, you can imagine as we come to earlier times, like one day, this, this relationship is going to be even stronger. So uh, you really do need to grind the cement fine, particularly to get the early strength. Um, and in fact, this is how cement producers um, tweak their process on a day-to-day -day basis. They'll be measuring their one-day strengths each day, and they have a certain target value that they're trying to maintain, and they'll increase or decrease their fineness a little bit just to, to keep it consistent. So uh, what are some of the attributes uh, of a good grinding aid chemical? Well, they tend to have strong dipolar moments, so this really helps them uh, adsorb uh, quickly onto the surface of the cement particles as they're being ground. Um, so you need to have a, a strong attraction to the positive charges on the particles, such as the calciums. Um, low molecular weights tend to be, uh, molecules tend to be uh, a little bit more nimble. They can quickly uh, diffuse over and, and do the job before the particles have a chance to re-agglomerate. Uh, and you do need low volatility chemicals as well. So the cement Grinding mill is, is quite hot. It could be up to 150 degrees C. And so if your grinding aid chemical is evaporating quickly, then it's not going to be effective. So water molecules shown here. Water is actually a pretty good grinding aid. I think the main drawback is that it is that it evaporates in the mill, but you uh, at low temperatures, you can actually uh, see a good effect from, from water. But uh, industrial, by far the most uh, common type of pure grinding aid would be glycols, which is a, a pretty wide category of, of chemicals. So this is a typical one here, uh, diethylene glycol would be uh, an effective grinding aid. So one last topic on grinding aids, I just want to mention there's another type of mill called a vertical roller mill, which operates on slightly different principles. So in this case, the, the clinker is ground by having this rotating table and the, and the clinker is carried under these heavy rollers, which just crushes them. Um, in, in a vertical roller mill, the grinding aid can help to stabilize the vibrations of the VRM uh, grinding table. So you normally have to add water spray onto there uh, in order to reduce the vibrations. Um, and you can actually spray less water if you're using a grinding aid, uh, which helps improve the quality of the cement. Um, so uh, 
Uh, in fact, many uh, grinding aid companies have developed formulations that are specifically designed to work well in a VRM. Okay, so the second category of cement additives, as I've said, uh, are called quality improvers. Um, so let's review again quickly what is the difference between the quality improvers and grinding aids, which is what we've already talked about. So we have here a, a list of attributes that you can have with, with cement additives. And um, as you can see, the grinding aids have the ones at the top, which are related to the grinding process and the dry powder uh, characteristics of the cement, whereas the quality improvers have the uh, properties or at least the potential for the properties down at the bottom, which are increased early and late strength, uh, changes in setting time, and, and even uh, reductions in concrete water demand. So quality improvers are doing uh, sort of both things. They're, they're helping with the grinding process, and then they're also improving the properties of the concrete. And so what I'd like to focus on here with quality improvers is the strength enhancement uh, attribute, which I think is the most important one. So strength enhancing additives, again, are added during, during the grinding step, and these chemicals uh, remain on the surface of the cement particles. And then when you go to make concrete, uh, they redissolve out into the mixed water, and they have a chemical effect that, that actually enhances the hydration process and, and changes the hydration process. Um, and to show an example of this, um, you can see on this plot, we have the results of what we call uh, a lab screening. So a, uh, a GCP customer will send a sample of their cement uh, to us, and that cement will have been made with a grinding aid rather than a quality improver, so it doesn't have these strength-enhancing chemicals on it yet. And we will make a series of mortars uh, out of it, and, and when we make those mortars, we will admix in uh, different quality-improving chemicals. So in this case, we've, we've tested five different chemicals. And uh, then, of course, we measure the strength. We can see the one-day strength on the top graph and the 28-day strength on the bottom graph. And we look to see uh, which one of our uh, quality improver formulations um, you know, are doing the best for this customer's cement. Um, and, and it's important to stress that there's a lot of variability in how cements react to these chemicals. So um, a product that works really well on one customer's cement won't work very well on the next customer's cement. So we really need to do these screenings. And so uh, as you can see that some of these uh, quality improvers are doing a pretty good job of increasing strength. We're getting uh, up to two megapascals or, or uh, 15, 17 percent uh, increase at one day. And we're getting maybe more like uh, three to four megapascals in some cases at, at 28 days. So these are this is a good response. It's, it's certainly not um, sort of an outstanding uh, example here. I've certainly seen uh, higher responses than that. It's a, pr it's a pretty typical response to the quality improvers uh, chemicals that we have. So the, the customer then will have to make a decision based on performance and also the cost, right? There's going to be differences in cost with these quality improvers, and that's going to be an important consideration. Um, so in terms of what are these chemicals, types of strength enhancers, I'm not going to get into that too much in this talk, but I'll say that the tertiary alkanolamines, or just uh, shorthand amines, um, are widely used for their strength enhancing uh, properties of the cement. So this is TEA, DIPA, TIPA, and several other ones like that. Um, so these can actually enhance the strength, not just at early ages, but at late ages, uh, as we saw. And so this plot here is just showing how these amines actually remain in the pore solution uh, for long periods of time. So this is going out to a week here, and you can see in, even after a week, some of these amines are still, you know, half half, uh, half of them that was added are still still there uh, to do their, their work. Um, and so that's how they're able to increase the strength at late ages. So then what is the what are these uh, additives actually doing to affect the strength? Well, there's a few different things that they do. Uh, one of them is simply to increase the degree of hydration of uh, some of the cement minerals, um, particularly the ferrite and aluminate phases. The degree of hydration could be improved. And you can see an effect in a, in a calorimetry curve here. You can see this on the green curve. You can see this peak here that appears when you're using the, uh, the quality improver. We can get a better morphology of the hydration products when the quality improver is used, and also an improved distribution of the hydration products. So we can have uh, less porosity at the interfacial transition zone, better filling of the porosity, so a, a finer pore structure and things like that. All, all the things that are known to increase strength. 
So since this talk is uh, supposed to be an industrial perspective, um, I want to talk just a little bit about what is it that a cement producer, so you know the manager of a cement plant, uh, what does he want from a grinding aid or a strength uh, enhancing chemical um, for his mill that's going to make sense from a financial perspective. So uh, let's go through a couple of um, scenarios here, and this is a little busy, so let's just do these one at a time. So. If the business scenario, as I call it, is production limited, what that means is that the manufacturer is making a lot of clinker, but he's having a hard time grinding it all. So maybe his mill capacity isn't as large as his kiln capacity. So in this case, uh, the key strategy, obviously, is that you need to increase the rate of production, you need to in in increase the grinding rate. So um, I think the most obvious solution is you just use a really strong grinding aid that makes the process more efficient, and that certainly works. But to show how this situation is actually a little more complicated than that, the other thing we talked about is the effect of fineness on the grinding efficiency. So the finer you grind your cement, uh, the longer you have to grind it to get there. So one way to make uh, the throughput of your mill faster is just to grind it less and, and just have a lower target fineness for the cement. Problem there, of course, is that you then have uh, lower strength development, particularly at early ages, and you can counteract that with a strength enhancer. So in this way, roundabout way, a strength enhancer actually helps to increase the production rate of the mill because you can use lower fineness. Another situation that the cement manufacturer could find themselves in is, is called clinker limited. So this is kind of the opposite case. So in this case, they have plenty of grinding capacity. They can grind all of the all the clinker that they have available. So in this case, being able to grind it faster is not really as much of an advantage, right? So, so they're going to end up with the same amount of cement to sell at the end of the day because they have all this grinding capacity. So what makes a lot of sense in this case is to dilute their cement with something cheaper. So limestone or, or a byproduct material, secondary cementing material. This way they can make more cement from the same amount of clinker. And when you do that, you get lower strength. So this is where a strength enhancer is very valuable. Um, another another approach they might have is just say, we're only going to sell so much clinker, let's just reduce our costs of producing it as much as possible. In this case, they'll just use the cheapest grinding aid that they can get away with, unfortunately. So another situation is quality limited. So I mentioned that the cement producer has a certain target strength that they're always trying to reach. They don't necessarily want to go above that, but they certainly don't want to fall below it. So if they find themselves unable to meet the target, uh, probably because there's some sort of problem with their clinker process with their kiln, uh, then they'll use a, um, a cement additive to increase the strength. In the short term, they can always grind finer, but that has a lot of drawbacks to it. So in the end, they're going to need a strength enhancer to help increase that strength. And finally, there's sort of a hypothetical case that I think we'll be seeing in the future, and I'll call that CO2 limited or carbon limited. So this would be the case where the cement producer is in a situation where uh, it's so expensive for them to emit more carbon because of uh, taxes and government regulations that it's going to kill their profits. So in this case, what they're going to need to do is significantly lower their clinker factors so that they can sell more cement with the same amount of clinker because it's the clinker that emits the CO2. So in this case, they're going to need strength enhancers and probably very efficient strength enhancers to be able to increase the amount of cement. So this is kind of a win-win situation for the industry and for the environment. And so it's something that we expect to see in the future. So moving on to the next topic of concrete admixtures. Uh, again, let's just start by looking at where they're made. Um, so this is a concrete batching plant or a ready mix plant as it's known in the United States. And so uh, quite simply, they just have a lot of storage for cement, aggregate, sand, gravel, and so on, and a water source, of course, and everything is just weighed out according to a mix design by, by computers. And then they have dispensers that will dispense the concrete admixture chemicals as well. And that all goes into a, a concrete mixer truck, which well, the job site might be a few hours away. It's important to notice, so you need to be careful that you have enough workability of the concrete to get to the job site and allow it to be placed. But uh, this is the point uh, at which the concrete admixture chemicals are added. So a few different types. The water reducers is what I'm going to talk about um, primarily here because I think they're the most important type. Uh, we also have air entrainers, which help with freeze-thaw resistance and cold climates. Uh, set modifiers to uh, increase or decrease the workability time, uh, time to set. Uh, strength enhancers can also be used at this stage. Now, we've already talked about those in the context of the cement additives, but they can also be used in concrete. And there's many other uh, things that you can do, but I won't get into all of them. So uh, first, a little bit about uh, concrete mix design. So concrete can 
contains coarse aggregate, fine aggregate, uh, the cement, of course, and the water and the admixtures. Uh, and, that, and that's kind of the minimum uh, uh, number of ingredients. We can also have secondary cementing materials, sometimes more than one, and it can get quite complicated. Um, and so it's really important to keep in mind that while um, the, the strength of the hardened concrete is certainly very important and certainly something that we're aiming for, the more immediate thing that you're designing for when you're making concrete is the workability. There's a certain uh, flowability or workability of the fresh state that's necessary for the particular application. And if you're not able to meet that workability, then you can't even place your concrete. So it doesn't matter how strong it's going to get. So we quantify that usually by something, uh, a slump test, which measures the slump or the spread. And, uh, you know, so first of all, how, how do you adjust the workability of your concrete? Well, if you're looking at this pie chart here, the main thing to adjust is the water content or the water to cement ratio. More water gives you more flowable, flowable cement uh, concrete and less water makes things uh, very stiff. Um, so that's pretty obvious. But then also we know that water cement ratio is a key parameter that controls the strength, you know, very strong relationship there. So here's just a graph of some some data that we've, you know, we've gathered. And, and this is the water cement ratio of the concrete on the X axis compressive strength of 28 days on the y-axis, and you can see um, just within the range of about 0.4 to 0.65, which is, a you know, all, all values that are used in concrete, uh, we have almost a doubling or halving of the 28-day of the, of the strength, so very strong effect there. So this really kind of sets the stage for why we need uh, water reducers. So this is just showing uh, a little bit more on the workability, so it really depends on the application. So if you're pumping the concrete into a large building over a long distance, you really need a very flowable concrete. You need a high workability. Um, if all you're doing is just emptying it out from the truck down, down the chute here, um, you can get away with a lower workability, right? So it really depends on how you're going to place the concrete. Uh, and on the right here, we're seeing a slump test. Um, you just fill up this cone with the concrete remove the cone and let it settle down into a, its final configuration. And the slump is just, just the distance that it, that it slumps downwards in the vertical direction. And you can also measure the spread flow, which is you know, how much wider the base gets, uh, so sort of equivalent. Okay, so now we've set the stage to talk about concrete water reducers. So these, these chemicals do something very simple. They just increase the workability or the flowability of the concrete. And so what that means is that if you're aiming for a certain workability, you can use less water when you add the additive. And that's why they're called water reducers. And this is very important because less water means more strength. So in a way, a water reducer really is a very effective uh, concrete strength enhancer when you use it that way. So on this graph here, uh, you can see the from the red line to the blue line, the big shift in the curve uh, when you add the water reducing additive. Um, so this is water content uh, versus uh, flow on the spread. So that's uh, similar to the slump. So if you take a certain mix design shown in red, you now add the uh, admixture into it without changing anything else, then you get a big jump in the flowability. And that's certainly one way that you can use them. Um, the more common way to think about it is that I have a certain mix design that has the flowability that I want. We'll say 400 on this one. And now I put in my chemical and I can maintain that flowability with a much lower water content now. So I have the same workability, but less water. So I'm going to have much better strength development. And that really, I think, is probably the most powerful um, application of these water reducers. So here's just a few um, types. It's uh, You'll often hear these terms, low range, mid range, and high range water reducers with the high range ones also known frequently as uh, super plasticizers. And, uh, the difference there is just, you know, how much uh, improvement in flowability, how much water can you take out? So I think it's useful to look, if you start with a water, uh, water cement ratio of 0.5, what's the final one? So uh, low range, you get like a modest change. With these high range water reducers, really uh, extreme changes in water cement ratio with the same flowability, you know, as far as down as uh, 0.35, which is very impressive. So how do these concrete water reducers work? Well, again, it's it's really a very similar process as the uh, as the grinding aid. It's it's a dispersant, so uh, it's just happening in water instead of in air. But the cement grains in water tend to agglomerate as well. This traps water between them, which doesn't then contribute to the flow, and so that's why you have uh, a stiffer paste. 
the uh, the chemical goes in there and pushes the cement particles apart and <clears throat> effectively releases this water inside and uh, you get the increase in workability. So again, there's a, a little optical micrograph on the left without the without the water reducer, you see the agglomeration of the particles and with the water reducer, all the particles are are now separated and you're going to have much better flow. OK, so let's talk a little bit about the chemistries behind these uh, concrete water reducers. Um, and as you can see from the table, there's a pretty wide variety of chemicals that can be used as water reducers, and I'm not going to talk about them all. Um, but I'd like to just mention first the lignosulfonates, uh, which were some of the earliest uh, commercial concrete water reducers. And lignosulfonates are a, a byproduct of the wood pulping process. Um, and then kind of on the other end of the spectrum, the, uh, the, the newest category and, and the most versatile category of water reducers are the polycarboxylate ethers or the PCEs. And so these PCE uh, chemicals um, can be designed to have different structures that will have different properties. Uh, they, they tend to have a long backbone with these side chains coming off of it, uh, like the teeth on the, of a comb. So it's often called a comb morphology. And uh, I think what makes them so versatile is that, you know, depending on how you manufacture them, you can have different lengths of the backbone, different lengths of the teeth, different spacing of the teeth. So you have sort of this uh, amazing flexibility in, in, in tailoring the structure. And then that results in a lot of um, tailored performance that you can get out of them. And in fact, there is this uh, quote that I'll bring up here from a recent PCE conference saying that PCEs are the most important innovation in building materials technology in the last 50 years. So, so that's not just concrete, that's all building materials technology. Now, I don't know if this quote is maybe uh, slightly exaggerated or arguable, but I think you can make a good case for it uh, based on what PCEs have allowed people to do with concrete, uh, even enabling, as, as I'll show you, uh, whole new categories of concrete that, that weren't possible uh, before. Um, they're not without uh, any drawbacks, however. Um, in particular, they, they, they can be retarders. Uh, they are retarders. Um, so they adsorb onto the phases inside the cement, and sometimes that causes retardation. So this is some nice work that was done about five or six years ago by March on. Um, what, what, what they're showing in the inset plot here is the concentration of the water reducer on the x-axis and the set time delay, so how many hours of increased set time you have on the y-axis. And so in phases one and two, the PCE is adsorbing onto the etringite phase, the AFT phase, which doesn't really cause much retardation. Then once that's sort of uh, completely covered, then it starts to adsorb onto the silicate phases, which are the ones that are trying to hydrate. And that does cause retardation. So now you see a much steeper relationship here. And then when those are saturated, it goes back on and you know adsorbs onto something else and you get a shallower behavior here. Uh, but you know, overall, you can see this, this plot going up six or eight hours. You don't want six or eight hours of set time retardation normally. So you either need to use a lower dose or you can add in another component, an accelerator to kind of compensate for that effect. So this is one of the categories of concrete, uh, self-consolidating concrete um, that's really only been possible since uh, the high range PCEs have been, have been developed. And so this is a highly flowable concrete that really reduces the amount of work that it takes to place it into a complicated formwork. <clears throat> so essentially it's so flowable that it spreads out and fills all the spaces under its own weight because it has a very low yield stress. Now, you could do that just by adding a lot of water, but then you would have terrible problems with segregation and bleeding, and then you would also have very low strength development. So that actually doesn't make any sense. So here you're able to have the very high flow, but yet once it hardens, it has the same kind of uh, strength development as normal concrete. There are a few disadvantages. Um, the mix designs for this are a little more complicated. Um, because it flows so easily, it creates a lot of uh, hydrostatic pressure inside the formwork. So sometimes the formwork needs to be a little bit more sturdy and they can be more expensive. So an even more recent development is something called control flow concrete. And this kind of has intermediate properties between normal concrete and then the SCC self-consolidating one. Um, and the idea here is to keep some of the advantages of SCC, but eliminate some of the disadvantages. So it's still highly pumpable. 
doesn't doesn't segregate um, needs a little bit more help it doesn't quite flow into place by itself it just needs a little bit more help but on the other hand it has a, a low formwork pressure and I think that the idea is that you, the customer can just keep their same mix design that they've been using before add in these these new chemicals and turn it into a control flow concrete without any further their adjustment, which is an advantage. And so overall, it's a lower cost uh, option. OK, so that's enough about <clears throat> water reducers. Um, there are other types of concrete admixtures. So set modifiers I've mentioned are also known as retarders and accelerators. And I think this is pretty simply illustrated on the calorimetry plot here. So the gray plot in the middle would be the normal uh, response, the kinetic response of the cement or the concrete. And when you add a uh, retarder in green, it pushes it to later times, and so you have longer workability. And then the opposite happens uh, with the red curve with the accelerator. So there's a lot of real uh, applications um, for this. I think I've already mentioned that if you have a long distance to go to get to the job site, you certainly are going to want to use a, a retarder to extend the times. Uh, on the other hand, if you're placing concrete in very cold weather, uh, which slows down the, uh, the the hydration process, you'll want an accelerator so that it sets uh, more quickly and so on. Um, you can see that uh, uh, retarders are often things like uh, sucrose and other carbohydrates, uh, whereas accelerators tend to be the inorganic salts, uh, calcium chloride, calcium nitrate, I think are two of the most uh, common ones. Another category is air entrainers. So, uh, concrete has a real problem when it's placed in cold environments that are going to be freezing and thawing. If you don't have any air entrainment, it'll actually get destroyed uh, pretty quickly. Um, so in order to use concrete in cold environments, it's necessary to entrain air bubbles into them. So it's shown in this uh, uh, nice micrograph here, these very round air bubbles here um, are acting to improve the frost resistance. So approximately 5% by volume of air is uh, added into the concrete and so these air entrainers what they do is they actually take the air bubbles that are naturally added to the concrete during mixing and which would normally then disappear quickly and they stabilize them so that they don't go away and they do that in, in a similar way uh, as as would be uh, a pce or a water reducer adsorbing onto a cement particle um, an air bubble actually has the uh, the chemicals adsorbed again onto that interface so this air bubble, instead of uh, diffusing out uh, during mixing, will then stabilize and remain in the concrete. OK, so the last topic I want to talk about in this presentation is the uh, CO2 footprint that comes from <clears throat> cement manufacture and how it can be reduced. So I think we all know this kind of bad news plot, uh, this pie chart here showing that you know, roughly 8% of all of the uh, global CO2 emissions come from the manufacture of and the placement of concrete. And from the concrete itself, actually, you know, something like 90% of that comes from the manufacture of the Portland cement clinker. So it's it's the uh, huge amount of fuel that's needed to heat up those the, the kilns to the very high temperatures. And then it's just the direct uh, calcination of the calcium carbonate limestone uh, it's heated up and that just directly releases that CO2 into the air. So everything else, you know, the, the transport and the, the aggregate and the, the grinding process, all that only adds up to 10% of the whole process. So it really comes down to making the clinker. So um, there have been a variety of, of solutions or, or levers for reducing CO2 footprint that have been proposed. Um, the one right now that is the, the key one is the third one here, um, reducing the amount of clinker in the cement. So, so really the clinker has the CO2 footprint. So if you can make concrete uh, or cement using less clinker, um, then you're able to then reduce the overall CO2 footprint of whatever application, you know, the road or the building that you're making um, will then have less clinker in it. And this is really the easiest way for us to reduce it right now and for maybe for the next 10 years ago or so. Um, it does have its limitations. And if, if we want to get anywhere near um, carbon neutrality, we're going to have to move down to number four there and capture that carbon. And, and so that's really a separate topic. But for now, we can make a, a good dent in the in the footprint by just making concrete with less clinker. Um, this plot here is just showing what happens when you start reducing the clinker content. So in this case, we've taken an industrial cement, and this is the, the blue curve here, 
and we've just diluted it with ground limestone in the lab. So we've just gotten up to 10, 15, 20, 35 percent limestone uh, blended into the cement. And then we're measuring here the two day strength and it obviously just declines because limestone is, is more or less inert. So if you use a strength enhancer, um, then in all these cases, we're getting two or three megapascals of increased strength. And so the concept is that the customer has a target strength here, but let's say it's about 32 uh, for his cement. And if he adds a strength enhancer, he, he, he increases it by a couple of megapascals. And so he can then start diluting it with limestone and you can add about 7% more limestone and still have the same target strength. And so the rule of thumb is that if you replace say 7% of the clinker with limestone, you've reduced the CO2 footprint by about 7%. So a 7% reduction is, is not astounding, but it, but it certainly, certainly is helpful. So this is, this is the approach right now. And so I just wanna show an industrial case study of uh, working with a customer that wants to make cement with a lower CO2 footprint. So in this case, they had the objective of, of replacing their type one cement uh, which had very little um, you know, secondary materials and it was mostly clinker with what's called a SEM2A-P. So that is a, a uh, pozzolan containing one. So this is a natural pozzolan material that's dug out of the ground and then can be added into the cement and does have some cementing ability. So they were gonna add about 8% pozzolan, uh, which means 8% lower clinker content. And they wanted to maintain their late strength, which was what the problem that they were having. So the approach that GCP would then have is we would do a lab screening um, just on their cement one to see which quality improvers uh, formulations that we have would be very effective on their cement. And so we found this one here on the second row that increased the 28 day strength of their cement one by about six megapascals. So that's a big increase. And so that gives you some room to work with. So they didn't need to be higher than 53. So if you can increase it to 59, now you can dilute it with something else and bring it back down to 53. And that's what was done here. So in this case, they produced the cement now with the pozzolan and uh, the quality improver. And then as is shown in the bottom row here, we're now able to match. So in the top row, it's the cement one with the original product. And in the bottom row, it's the pozzolan cement with the uh, more powerful and more expensive quality improver. And you're getting the same uh, late day strength. Simple example of a, of a, of a successful conversion of a, a customer from one type of cement to a, a greener cement and still getting the same performance. So uh, these are some estimates of, of you know, what are the savings. So um, in the left plot here, we're seeing the uh, CO2 footprint directly. Uh, so this is how many kilograms of CO2 are released for every ton of cement that's made. So for their original type one cement, it was 683 and that was lowered to 623 by the addition of, of the pozzolan. And this is the savings in euros per year that they're able to get from that. And the savings comes from primarily the fact that they in Europe are paying to emit CO2. So um, they're paying about, uh, in this case, I believe 50 euros for every ton of CO2 that's emitted. So uh, when you when you allow them to emit less CO2, it's a direct cost savings in Europe. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop it there, uh, go to the summary slide. Um, so just a couple of uh, you know main points here. Uh, the, the grinding aids make the cement manufacturing process uh, more efficient. Uh, we can improve the fresh concrete properties with with concrete admixtures. Uh, you know, we can improve the hardened concrete properties such as strength and durability through the use of the quality improvers, which can be in the cement additives or in the concrete admixtures. Um, the development of the polycarboxylate uh, high range water reducers has enabled entire new categories of concrete, um, such as the self consolidating concrete and uh, the cement additives and admixtures are both playing an important role in the reduction of the carbon footprint of uh, concrete. Thank you for your attention.